Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're following us from. Welcome to the fifth Global SIT webinar and the first one in 2021. And what a better way to invigorate our conversations on citizenship in the new year than by focusing on the link between money and membership. My name is Jelena Jankic and I'm co-director of the Global SIT Observatory here at the Schumann Center and the author of the Global Market for Investor Citizenship published with Paul Grave Macmillan in 2019. Today's webinar is entitled Investor Citizenship, a Challenge for Citizenship or a Sign of its Transformation. Today we gather six speakers in a two-part roundtable discussion. In part one, Martijn van der Brink, a British Academy postdoctoral fellow from the University of Oxford, Lior Erez, a postdoctoral fellow from the University of Haifa, and Ayelet Shahar, a professor of law and global affairs at the University of Toronto, will unpack the much debated notion of genuine links. In the second part of our webinar, Christine Surak from the LSC, Laura Brio from Transparency International, and Manuela Boatka from Albert Ludwigs University of Freiburg will discuss the benefits and drawbacks of investor citizenship. Each of our speakers will have six minutes to reflect on two questions that they prepared beforehand. After these uh, first presentations, we'll open the Q&A. So please do Q use Q&A session in Zoom and direct your questions to one of our speakers. In case that you direct your question to the whole panel, uh, I'll take the liberty and allocate your question to one of our speakers today. As Christine Surak, as a footnote, has to leave us at 5 p.m., we will follow up her brief presentation immediately with questions and answers uh, for, her, uh, for her section here. So without further ado, uh, I would like to start this webinar by asking uh, Martin for a view from the legal perspective. So what does the principle of genuine link represent in the context of citizenship? What constitutes this notion of a link? And how can we determine uh, if and when a link is actually genuine? My time. Um, thank you, Yelena, first of all, for this very kind introduction and, and for, for having me here, here and inviting me to participate. So as you asked me, so in this contribution, I, would, I will focus on some of the legal aspects relating to the principle of, of general link, um, especially in the context of, of some recent uh, disputes um, within the EU between the European Commission and Malta and, and Cyprus. Now we find the principle of general link in the jurisprudence of international courts. The Co European Commission relies on it in its arguments against the investor citizenship practices of Malta and Cyprus. But the principle is, is very controversial among many legal scholars. So what should we make of this principle from, from a legal point of view? Now to, to answer that question, I think that we first need a better understanding of what we mean when we speak of the principle of genuine link. And one of the things that I show in my own work uh, is that the term genuine link is very often used to describe not one, but two very different principles. And those principles are uh, at times confused. So first of all, the principle of genuine link can be used to condition the recognition of citizenship. In the infamous Nottebohm decision, the International Court of Justice decided that states do not need to recognize the nationality of a person if that person doesn't have a genuine link with um, that state. Secondly, the principle can be used to condition the allocation of citizenship. Used this way, the principle of genuine link represents the idea that individuals should be allocated citizenship if they have a genuine link to a state or should not be allocated citizenship if they do not have such a link. So we use the same term, genuine link, to describe two very different principles, one relating to the recognition and another to the allocation of citizenship. So there are times they are confused, but I think it's important to treat the two principles separately because they raise different normative as well as legal questions. So I'd like to um, discuss um, the legal aspect of both principles so in turn. So in my view, we can be relatively brief about the application of the principle of genuine link to the recognition of citizenship. I think it is widely recognized by many legal scholars that 
Not a bomb is, is a bad judgment and that conditioning the recognition of citizenship on a genuine link is a bad idea. Allowing states not to recognize the nationality of persons that have a tenuous link to the state of nationality would, for example, render many persons stateless for the, um, um, for the purpose of diplomatic protection. And I think that in the EU, the consequences could be even worse. For example, the right to move and reside freely within the EU depends for most persons on having a member state nationality. So allowing member states not to recognize someone's nationality may undermine the exercise of the right to free movement among others. So I think this is why the Court of Justice of the European Union has decided rightly, I think, that not a bomb doesn't apply within EU law, that member states are under an obligation to recognize each other's um, nationality. But what about the second understanding of the principle of genuine link? Should the allocation of citizenship be conditioned on a genuine link? Now this, condition, this question has, I think, a normative as well as legal dimension, and I do not think that they are the same. It may be that enforcing the principle of genuine link is normatively desirable, but legally impossible. So I will focus only on, on the legal uh, dimension. So can the principle, and, and in particular on, on the, the dimension within the EU, can the principle of genuine link be enforced as a principle in the EU law? Is investor citizenship incompatible with EU citizenship law as the commission claims in its recent in the proceedings against Malta and Cyprus? I have a hard time understanding why the commission thinks this. First of all, everyone accepts that the EU does not have the power to define who can be an EU citizen. It is for the member states to determine this. Of course, the EU Court of Justice has uh, decided that member states must exercise these powers having due regard to um, EU law, but the case law offers no support, in my view, for an argument in favor of the genuine link principle. In my view, the, the case law is weak in terms of argumentation and, and hardly supports the conclusions that the court has reached so far. But even if it does, the case law hasn't really imposed any significant restrictions on the rules on the loss and acquisitions of nationality by the member states. They have changed very little in practice, so it is very hard to see what could justify something as far reaching as a genuine link requirement. Now, the Commission argues that the principle of genuine link must be introduced in order to protect the essence of EU citizenship. But if one thing defines the essence of EU citizenship, it is that it is a derivative status that depends on member state nationality, not the other way around. The treaties are very clear about that, in my view. So whatever we think about investor citizenship or the principle of genuine link in normative terms, I think that we should recognize that the principle cannot be enforced as a principle under EU law as it stands right now. That would require treaty change. But I'm afraid I have to end on this, what may seem to some of you a rather pessimistic conclusion, and I'd be happy to hear your, your thoughts and, and, and disagreements, and I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. So I'd like to follow up um, with the same question to Lior. So could you give us your views from the perspective of political philosophy as to what the principle of genuine link represents in the context of citizenship and what constitutes this link and how can we determine if and when uh, this link is actually genuine? Lior, over to you. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, so I think the question here is complex. Um, within political philosophy, Citizenship is a contested and multifaceted concept. It encompasses notions of identity, of membership, legal status, as Martin already mentioned. It is both inclusionary and exclusionary, and it signifies something rather different when we see it from the perspective um, of interna the international system and from within the boundaries of the state. So what I want to do is to highlight some of the tensions between these interpretations and to say something about how they apply to the principle of genuine link how uh, we can determine whether it is genuine, and I think more importantly, who can determine it. So I will discuss this in rather general terms, and I'll bring it to uh, back to uh, the question of investment citizenship only at the end. I hope this is not disappointing to the rest of the panel. Um, but the main distinction I want to highlight is this. Should we think of the genuine link as a necessary condition for citizenship or merely a sufficient one? 
put differently, is the point of the principle primarily inclusionary to make sure that all those with genuine links can become citizens? Or is it to ensure that only those with genuine links can become citizens, which would have exclusionary implications? What I want to do is put forward the view that this principle should only serve as a sufficient condition to allow for democratic self-determination of citizenship rules. Now in liberal normative theories of citizenship, the genuine link principle represents the view that citizenship is or should be conditioned on the existence of certain social facts. Differences aside, the main uh, theorists of, uh, present, uh, presenting this position, Ayelet being one of them, of course, with the use nexi principle, but also Joseph Karens with social membership theory and Rainer Baubach with stakeholder citizenship, all draw this notion of genuine connection to a particular state, society, or political community. And these influential theories all seek to address the problem of both over-inclusion and under-inclusion in the polity created by the unsatisf unsatisfactory principles of birthright citizenship. Now, under-inclusion in citizenship is obviously a pressing normative problem. Indeed, it's a democratic injustice. And it's vividly exemplified by the harm to people who fall through the cracks of birthright citizenship. Just think about uh, dreamers in the US, for example. So these are people who are part of society, who are subject to the authority of the state, but they are not recognized formally as full members of this uh, polity. So as such, the idea of the genuine link serves as an inclusionary corrective, although not necessarily as a substitute to birthright citizenship. Joseph Karen says, uh, argues, for example, that every adult who lives in a democratic political community on an ongoing basis should be a citizen. And Ayelet and, and Reiner make similar claims. But this problem of under-inclusion could be resolved even if we think of the genuine link as a sufficient condition. To prevent over-inclusion, which is the problem with investment citizenship, we need to go further and think about genuine link as a necessary condition for citizenship. And this is, I think, a problem because over-inclusion is a far less intuitive injustice than under-inclusion. To explain what is wrong with over-including people in the polity, we need a much thicker, more substantive theory of citizenship and perhaps even of community or national identity. One that will um, appeal to notions such as social attachment, civic duties, uh, et cetera. And to complicate matters, I think this prescriptive position may well be one that is in tension with how actual citizens um, of the polity perceive the political community and who should be included in it. If we take seriously the idea that democratic polities have the right to self-determine, it seems to me that at least sometimes, some will choose to extend citizenship to individuals who do not meet the criteria of genuine link defined by liberal normative theories of citizenship. So there's at least some reason to think that the genuine link as a regulative principles um, to prevent under-inclusion, but not as a necessary condition for citizenship. Um, and this is in order to allow for pluralism of democratic conceptions about who belongs. Um, I will say less about uh, the point of view of international law, mostly because Martin has already masterfully covered it. I just want to say that internationally, citizenship has necessarily this, this thin conception uh, as the legal stat status linking individuals and in state. So normatively, and I think this is where I defer with Martin, because I think this is a normative point, not just a question of practical and, and um, uh, uh, the feasibility of implementation. I think normatively, this is a feature and not a bug. It allows, again, for the pluralism of democratic conceptions and for self-governing policies to determine their own membership rules. So what does this mean for investment citizenship? I think primarily it means that if it, this practice is wrong, it's not because it violates the principles of the genuine link. It's, uh, it's wrong insofar as it is not democratically authorized and therefore a corrupt practice in the moral sense of the term. So in other words, the moral evaluation of investment citizenship should be focused on how this policy is enacted rather than on the principles grounding it, which is the issue in, in my view. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lior. Uh, before I give the word to Ayelet, I would just like to remind uh, everyone in the audience to please write your questions in the Q&A session, which will start uh, immediately after Ayelet's speech for the part of the webinar on the genuine links. So I would like to go ahead by giving the floor to Ayelet Shahar, who, whom will, I would like to address uh, the same two questions. 
Uh, could you please give us a view based on your extensive work uh, on the notion of citizenship? Wonderful, thank you everyone. And thank you, Yelena, for inviting us. And uh, I agree actually with uh, Lior um, in the sense that I think it's a very difficult question. We're, it's an uncharted terrain. So I, uh, even on the legal front, I think Martin is giving us too simple a story, but let's uh, just go with my six minutes, which are very short and I'll try and address both questions. So on the first one, uh, which uh, we were asked, what's the relationship between uh, the genuine link and citizenship? So here I would draw initially a distinction, which to some extent actually echoes what we've already heard from Lior and from uh, Martine. So there are two ways to think about this connection. One I would call is remediable, a remedial equitable uh, way of securing membership for individuals who we know actually have the genuine link, but have no access to membership. And I agree, uh, again, I think the Dreamers is the best example in the United States, individuals who came to the United States at a very early age, grew up there. It's the only country they know as their home. They're limited due to a legal regulation. They are just unable to acquire membership. That is a deep injustice. And I think their use, uh, the, something like a genuine link or what I called uh, use next. And I agree also a host of Reiner, Babuk and Joe Karens and a whole uh, set of other people have written about it. I think it's it's strongly persuasive and not because I hold this uh, position, but I think it's just, it's, it's a strong one and it, the, the burden would fall on the person who wants to uh, challenge that, I believe. So in this case, individuals have a genuine link, have no way to be uh, naturalized or to even gain any kind of security. And then we would think of a link as being relevant. So I think that's uh, one way to think about it. And again, if we look at what the current US administration, I am uh, quite certain that the Biden administration will actually take something like a use next route and indeed naturalize or at least allow regularization of status, uh, initially permanent residents and allowing individuals later on to naturalize. The current numbers we're hearing is eight years now and probably for some populations such as the dreamers, um, temporary protected uh, status individual TPS would probably have a shorter version. All right, so that's on the way of inclusion on the other, or, or on the way of remedial equitable uh, route to citizenship. The other way to think about it is more relevant for our discussion about investor citizenship, which is the question, can a genuine link be a preliminary threshold? And it's a preliminary threshold as, as actually Martin uh, said and also Lior, it's either for uh, gaining access domestically to membership or for the recognition of other countries of that particular grant of citizenship. And it's a very important distinction strongly established in law. Um, I think in terms of the question, and here I'm really, I'm, I'm moving between these two hats, the legal and the normative as everyone else has done in this particular uh, forum. The, so here we have individuals who arguably have no link to a given jurisdiction, but they do seek to have membership in that particular community. And that community, according to its norms, currently grants their membership, mostly acquiring citizenship, in order to gain a passport and indeed in the EU, we all know, we have actually, I wanna uh, acknowledge Sam Schmidt, one of the doctoral uh, members working in my team in, in, in Germany at the Max Planck. Uh, we have actually looked at some of the intermediaries. What is it that they're selling? 90% of them uh, affirming our thought are selling EU citizenship. No one wants to get Maltese citizenship with all due respect. So we know that. So this makes our story complicated because what is being, a, a nation state is selling its citizenship. So there you could hold the old Westphalian, actually very traditional sense of saying only self-determination, but what they're actually selling is EU membership, which is not solely Maltese or or, or, or from Cyprus or Bulgaria, or whichever country, right? It's, it's a union-based um, membership. And this is where the complexities arise. And this is where I would want to have our discussion later on in the Q&A. But given that I was asked two questions, not just um, how do you think about the, the link, but also what would use Nexi or, or a genuine link mean in this particular context? Here, I actually want to be very clear. And I think this would be uh, my uh, recommendation if I were to ask. First of all, we don't know whether, uh, even if it gets to the courts, if the courts would say it's up to each member state to determine. It might be that they would be differential in that way. But you can say that because of that supranational aspect, there you might get some bite. And that's where you might say you need the, the, the genuine link in order for other members uh, state not to recognize in the formal sense they're all part of the same union. But in order for this to make sense in the context of a supranational citizenship, we can't just fall back either to the domestic or to the traditional international way of doing things. We need something new. And this would be the challenge for the courts if it gets to them. So if I were to ask what how to think about the genuine link in this particular context of investment citizenship, my answer 
answer would be extremely clear and extremely easy and very, very lean. Uh, because I would say the only way to establish this in the in EU context is to say you need to have actual residency, which is the standard way to establish naturalization in all immigrant receiving countries. In Canada, you need to be present three years out of five before you naturalize. In the US, again, it's five years, but they count differently the number of years they have continued residence plus physical president presence. Australia asks you for four years, and there's a very specific set of rules of how many days you can be out of the country, yes, no. So even these countries, which no one would say are limiting uh, mobility, you are free to move. And indeed, there's a, a, even within those criteria of residence, there's a specific amount of time where you can be out of the country or you can seek special um, permission if you need to be out of the country for longer. I would just say that should be the EU rule. Genuine link should meet residence, but real residence, physical residence, not just having an address as you require in Malta. You have to be there physically. You want to carry a passport? Do that. That's not such a heavy requirement. It's not linguistic. It's not at all belonging in the heavy sense or the thick sense. It has no legal uncertainty, which is a real concern with the other ways of thinking about the Nuttenbaum application. No legal uncertainty. The rules would be very clear. How many days in a year you have to be there or altogether, there's, say, three out of five years great do it i want to see the russian oligarchs who are going to live in malta under these conditions if that's the rule follow it it's clear it's clean it's not culturally loaded and it gives us a clear standard that would be my strong recommendation for this particular challenge thank you so much ayelet uh thank you to all of our panelists in the first part of this discussion uh, i would like to open the floor for q a and we already have uh, to uh, two questions, one from Dmitry Kochenov, who did not direct it to any particular speaker. So I would uh, essentially, as it's a question that has to do um, with legal aspects, uh, I would direct it to Martin. So why can we talk about the general, uh, the Dmitry asks, uh, what he wonders is why the talk about general, uh, general, genuine links principle, there's a typo there. There's no such a principle in international or EU law and political science and sociology. The idea is, as we have also seen in this panel, highly contested. So, Martin, what would be uh, the value added in framing the discussion on investor citizenship through genuine links? Um, thank you, um, uh, Dimitri, for the question. I think that's, I mean, it's not an easy question. I think the reason that we are speaking of this as a principle is, is I mean, I, I think to a degree because, I mean, it's, it's for historical reasons, the fact that it was used for the International Court of Justice and has since been taken up by citizenship scholars and also by EU institutions. So it, it, to, to a certain extent, it's because of historical reasons. And, and maybe, so I think, to, on the one hand, I agree with you. There's not a principle that we um, see a lot in like EU law and international law. But at the same time, I think that a lot of states use something or use sort of proxies or sort of practical sort of devices like residence requirements and, and civic integration tests, linguistic tests that to certain to some way in some way give effect to the idea that a citizenship or that person should have genuine social ties with the state in order um, to acquire citizenship. Uh, that maybe doesn't really answer your question of whether we should call this a principle um, or not, but I think, I'm not sure if the idea of general, uh, of genuine links is uh, as opposed to the notion of citizenship as uh, I think you believe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martijn. Uh, I would like to direct uh, Reiner Baubock's objections to Lior. Uh, first one, over-inclusive citizenship jeopardizes the internal conditions under which a polity can perceive itself as self-governing community of equal citizens by including persons who do not share the same stake in self-government as most citizens. And the second objection of Reiner's is that self-determination in the sense that states are entirely free to determine who their citizens are, jeopardizes the external function of citizenship to determine which state is responsible for protection uh, of the rights of which individual. Uh, it also undermines the mutual recognition of citizenship by states. Uh, Lear, how would you respond to Reiner's objections to your argument? 
in, in one minute or less. Uh, yeah, so I, there, are two, there are two points I, I want to make here. One is, uh, so I'm not surprised that uh, Rainer uh, opposes to uh, my uh, crit uh, critique of over-inclusion, mostly because of his theory of stakeholder citizenship, which uh, comes into the fore here. I think that's partly is why I want to highlight um, the democratic authorization of the people to essentially determine what the stake is, right? So under certain prescriptive theories, uh, we would determine what uh, an equal stake in self-governance is from an external point of view. And I want to take the internal point of view as well. So I think that we need to allow for certain pluralism um, in the way that political communities um, determine what is it to, to be a member of this community. And once those external individuals become citizens, I think they therefore share the, the same stake as everyone else. Um, that's a, the one thing. The second point about uh, is, is a point that I didn't have time to get into in my presentation, which has to do with the international element. And I think here, I want to push the same point that I made regarding the domestic uh, perspective. So genuine link would be a, a sufficient principle. It, in a sense, it will restrict, it, it, it doesn't mean that every state is completely free to determine whatever it wants with regards to who counts as its citizens, because there is a, a regulative principle. So it, there's a principle there to prevent states from not recognizing individuals who have a genuine link uh, in the in neutral sense. Uh, and there's also something like what happened, again, I'm not an international lawyer, something like what happened in, in the Notbom decision only from a normative perspective. So states are required to recognize anyone that um, holds a genuine link in the in normative liberal sense, uh, but in the cases of abuses of rights and, and issues like that, they could not recognize those individuals. So I think in, in that sense, I'm more, uh, I, my position is closer to Reiner than, uh, than he presents. Thank you very much. Uh, Lior, and we have Willem Mass's question for Islet. Um, Willem asks whether you're suggesting that the EU should limit direct or direct what member states can do uh, in terms of requiring physical presence, and how would this reconcile with uh, the sovereignty of the member states themselves? Islet. Yeah, thank you, Willem. It's a great question. And of course, this is really the, the hardest uh, nut to crack in this particular context. And I, I would say the competence is a national one. I doubt that the EU would direct any uh, member state in the sense of saying you have to do this or you have to do that. So I don't think this would be the route that they would go through. I think they would have to say that it's something like these statuses are um, are, are deeply linked. They are, I think this is the language actually that we know it, it has been used, inextricably linked the national and the supranational here. And because it is a derivative status, I would say precisely because of that, there is um, the, the, the position on, you know, the, the assumption is currently nationality, the, each member state defines it, then automatically you become an EU citizen, right? That's the, in a way, it's a nice, simple model. The problem is here, what happens if the effects are not neutral to other member states? And that is, I believe, the condition with investor citizenship. So that is the question. This is why I said it's an uncharted terrain. If it were just international law, you could say other member states or, or other, there would not be member states. There would be other countries might say uh, this, we, would, we do not recognize this for reasons X, Y, or Z. And just going back on the point on self-determination, frankly, we all know that it's not true that citizenship that states can do anything so if a country x tomorrow morning says we are only admitting people who are paying a million euros plus their eyes have to be blue and their skin better be white then we would know that it's 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 it's, it's impossible it's it would not other member states would not have to recognize it and certainly the commission would not have to or the courts etc so eu institutions are not bound to accept everything that a member state does because we know there are certain restrictions even on this high self-determination uh, notion which is citizenship which is sovereign in that deep sense so we know that there are certain restrictions. So the question is, how would this be done? And I think this is why I said there's, uh, there should be tremendous creativity here in the sense of saying it's the impact on other member states or the impact on the general status called supranational citizenship, European citizenship, which, as I mentioned, is what these purchasers are buying. So this is why I think there has to be an entryway there. But how to do it would be very tricky. And I would definitely not recommend um, forcing this on the member states. It's really, it's, it's not the competence division. So I don't think this would even technically be possible, uh, as I think Martin said, without an amendment of the treaties. And, and that would not be a wise way to go. The question is, how do you craft this in a way that says it's because it's a joint 
status that you're giving and that's the union status the european citizenship that would be the entryway but again it's not going to be standard international law it's not going to be standard domestic law it would have to be an innovation of european law but we know european citizenship in and of itself is a whole invention and we even know that when we talk about loss of citizenship there is an ability or the court has said that while they do recognize the competence of of, of member states at least with loss of nationality they required individual proportionality analysis so it could be something like that so you know the judges are super creative lawyers are super creative that's what we do that's what the good people who do law do so maybe they'll find something like analogous to individual proportionality in the laws they would say i don't know something proportionality of residence and acquisition i mean we can imagine the new standards this is what as i said this is what good good lawyers do and i'm i'm sure someone in the commission has thought about it and is probably developing these standards as we speak about them i hope they do so or the courts could do so or some of us as as, as academic scholars could do so i think there's tremendous creativity to be done here Thank you so much, Ayelet. We have an interesting question which draws on the relationship between money and membership throughout history uh, from Hans Ulrich Yazurundo Oliveira, who asks whether it isn't the case that in the early days, so he mentions the 17th century, the normal way of acquisition of citizenship or belonging to a city was to purchase it. So he's asking what's new? In Amsterdam, the price was 50 guilders. Um, Martijn, uh, since uh, I think you are the resident person from the Netherlands here uh, in this panel, I was wondering whether you're aware of any historical examples of the sale of citizenship um, that you could mention to us and contextualize it in the discussion of the genuine link. So oh, I, I have to be honest, historic, I'm, I'm not probably the right person to ask um, sort of such historical questions. So I, on that account, my, so my knowledge is, is, um, is very limited. So I, it, it may be true that there is in some sense nothing new, that history is, is repeating itself as, as so often um, happens. Um, so I think, but if there's something new in that, it's also what, what I let mentioned, and I, I think I let and I disagree to some extent about the law, but I think we do not disagree on, on, on everything. But I think if there's, the, what is clearly new these days is, is the European uh, dimension that creates certain um, tensions and challenges that we, we see playing out sort of uh, right now. So I think, which is in a way, at least for me as sort of a, a legal scholar makes um, uh, the issue interesting. Um, is it new? To be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not the right person to um, ask that question. So maybe someone else with more knowledge of this um, is willing to take up uh, this question. Thanks. I'm happy to take it if you want me, Elena. Perfect. Thank you. So my time. I, I very much like not to disagree too much with you. So great. <laughs> I'm glad we're on the, the same terrain. And it is, of course, it's, it's the European dimension. This is what makes it fascinating for all of us. And this is what makes it challenging. But again, innovation only comes when, you know, necessity breeds innovation. So the innovation will come, I believe. On the question of the historical, you know, this is a very interesting question because to some extent we can say what we're talking about is modern citizenship, which the break would have to be, you know, post French Revolution, etc. So prior to that, citizenship was never equal. So the, even the basic perimeter and it was not democratic so the, the very basic perimeters that we're thinking about today are just not analogous in that way so I think uh, you know I've been given this question I think it's a great question and the historical details are fascinating so if you want to send me some more of your research I would love to read more about it <laughs> and Villa Matt who's also in the room has done some research on the Netherlands so you know it's a fascinating question but I think it's it just it doesn't bear on us in the sense of today's uh, citizenship it's a very very different concept and if we think about it as democratic and egalitarian with which I assume at least the, the three people in, in our section uh, agree with that, then it, it doesn't bear on us. It, it, it's not a, it doesn't, it, we don't even have to account for it. We can just say, well, we're very happy that citizenship is no longer as unequal as it was. I couldn't sit on this panel and most other people because I, because of my gender. So, you know, it, it has changed and I think some, thankfully so. Thank you so much, Ayelet, for following up on that question. We have quite a few questions. Um, so I'm going to try to allocate just one question per person, uh, and then I hope that we will be able to continue this discussion uh, in the uh, in the future. Um, so there are 
anonymous attendees who ask the panel uh, what you think about programs like Estonia's e-residency that give uh, people electronic citizenship and some benefits and access to the EU and some parts uh, of its market, regardless of location or current citizenship. Um, I was wondering if Leo could give us his perspective on that, and then I would ask Martin uh, to also briefly reflect on it from the legal perspective. Right. So, uh, so I'm not sure I do have a lot to say about the Estonian program, apart from the fact that um, when I try to um, consider examples of this kind of what would be considered as over inclusion, um, it seems that the uh, something like the Estonian model would be on the extreme side of that spectrum. Because what uh, I, I think about when I think about we want to allow for pluralist uh, conceptions of, of membership is um, approaches to say diasporas, to uh, historical communities. And that's something that has to do with the self-conception of these uh, polities. I think what is reflected in both in investment citizenship programs and in the Estonian program, and I think this is something that uh, perhaps the second uh, session will discuss uh, more thoroughly, is something about the changing conception of citizenship towards uh, neoliberalism and how this is conceived. And I think, uh, I know that Manuela has, has uh, written about this and this thing, so I would very much like to hear, I'm, I'm uh, pushing the question towards them in a sense. Thank you so much. Martai? So, I mean, I, I, I'm not very familiar with Estonia's uh, program, so I don't have very strong opinions on, on that program. But I think the question raises an interesting, like. It, it's in a way draws our attention to investor residents. So we talk about a lot about investor citizenship, but that there are many states across the world, but certainly within the EU, that have investor residence programs, and some of them are not that different from investor citizenship programs. Which then I think raises the question when we talk about genuine links, the desirability of the principle of genuine link, like what would be the consequences if the EU would apply such a principle, um, not just respect to investor citizenship, but also to um, investor residents. I, I don't think Estonia's program is part of that. But like, and also other sort of programs like the remedial citizenship programs of, of Spain and, and Portugal. So I, I think in a way that the focus on, on investor citizenship um, alone may be a bit um, too narrow. I think there are many other programs that are similar and that in a way may raise similar normative issues, but also are if we apply, or if the EU would want to apply a principle of, of genuine link as a principle of EU law, it would um, raise the question of what to do with investor residence programs and other um, citizenship rules that do not respect such principle. Thank you very much, Martin. And to conclude this first session, I would like to address a final comment to Ayelet. Uh, by an anonymous attendee who says that smaller EU countries rely on cultural, economic, and political contributions from diaspora who all live over the world. For these nations, residence language and other requirements for citizenship undercut this really valuable resource. Um, how would you address this, this comment in the context of the genuine link doctrine? Well, principle. I think this is a very interesting question. I, I don't know what you're thinking about the diaspora because the diaspora could be people who are citizens and just live abroad. So it could be that they're already citizens. It could be that their, their children are most likely, if it's a Yusanguinis country, they're probably citizens just by virtue of, 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 of the parentage principle. So it could be that they are already citizens so this would not arise. Uh, because our concern, remember we said, we, we're thinking about the genuine link in two circumstances. A person already resides in the country but has no access to membership or that person has no connection to the country country, but seeks to acquire it. And in our case of investors through purchasing, through just a, a money transfer. And the idea under these, uh, you know, if you abstract it a little bit, the idea would be that your money does the work of, of instead of, it's, 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 it's a substitute. That, that's what grants you the connection. And I think here, because of the nature of citizenship, I would want to resist that. So it doesn't mean that we're resolving all the problems in the world. And if you know my work, you know, I, I, I personally would not want to have citizenship transmit itself 
through generations and generations. I would even ask that of diasporas if it's after the third generation, for example, but it's a broader discussion. But I think you're right to say, and I think Martine is right to say that once we think about citizenship, there are just a multiplicity of ways to enter citizenship. And I would emphasize that. I think no one is assuming uh, that um, there would be one route to citizenship. I think that's just against all the nature that we know, and partly for the reasons that Lior mentioned of pluralism and, and democratic um, self-determination. But we are thinking, my recommendation here on the, on the link in the sense of physical residence refers specifically to investor citizenship programs. I really think it would resolve a lot of the normative concerns, plus the legal uncertainties. Plus, again, it might change the composition. It might be that people who are currently willing just to transfer, for them probably a million euros is what is for me ten dollars i mean they probably don't even notice it it's a buck in the drop out if, if you're so rich that you can do it you just don't notice it so i would say that if that's the situation then show that you're really you you want that passport be in that country for a certain amount of time as very clearly defined by statutory by law and then get your citizenship and that's it that would be my resolution for this particular problem it's not solving everything under the sun there's so many different aspects of citizenship and you're right there, there for some countries there would be different routes and different rules and it would make perfect sense for their own history for their own uh, specific uh, concerns so we can't really answer all of that just to make sure that you know it's clear that i think all the three of us really referred specifically to investor citizenship in the european context which just raises the most interesting fascinating things and it's the most um intellectually challenging one and also the most pressing one legally and politically so uh, just you know by, by point of clarification there thank you so much alet and thank you to also martine and lior and now we conclude the first part of our webinar we'll come back to the three speakers for their final reflection on this fascinating topic uh, and now we'll start the second part of our webinar, which deals with the benefits and drawbacks of investor citizenship programs. Uh, I would like to start by giving the word to Christine Surak, whose latest work has examined the motivations uh, of the beneficiaries of investor citizenship programs to uh, tell us what, what kind of benefits can investor citizenship bring to uh, individuals, to states, or to the citizenship industry, and what would be the problematic aspects of these programs? Uh, Kristen, I hand it over to you. Great, thanks very much. And I'm going to have to offer my apologies as well because I'm teaching a, I'm teaching a class at um, 5 p.m. Central European time. So I sort of have to talk and run um, to do that, but thankfully because of Zoom I can. Um, so, so what I'll talk about, you know, I'll address these questions from the standpoint of the, of the research that I've been doing um, all around the world, going to the countries that sell citizenship, talking to the people who buy it and the intermediaries who make the market, which involved a lot of interviews and even more travel. I'm glad I got it done um, at that particular point in time. Um, so, so thinking first of what the, the, why people do this, what are the advantages thought? Um, my research has shown, um, based on these interviews, is that Typically, they're looking for benefits in third countries, and this is this is pretty well established by now. It's not the rights that you get, you know, within a state, but the rights that you get without outside of a state, and those are usually secured by agreement or by by treaty. Um, in terms of what people seek, one is mobility in the present, and that's sort of an obvious one, especially from if you're from a country where it has very poor um, visa-free access. Um, it, but present mobility could also mean, um, for example, and I found a number of cases of this, of, of what would be considered downgrading citizenship in, in a way. So Americans um, doing a lot of travel in Africa often find it safer to travel on a non-American passport because of threats of kidnapping and, and, and this sort of thing. Um, the second reason that people do, and the reasons are not mutually exclusive, would be future mobility, a sort of a plan B or an insurance policy. It's basically a hedge, a hedge against uncertainty. And wealthy people are consummate hedgers. They're always trying to protect themselves and to protect their assets. And particularly if you're from an authoritarian country, you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. Um, so they're looking for an exit option and they're looking for something that they can have um, just in case. And in many cases, um, you, you know, the citizenship, the passport that can be acquired then through citizenship just stays in a safety deposit box, especially if you're, you know, say Chinese and, and the, um, the Chinese government doesn't allow dual citizenship in the first place. Um, and then a third important reason is that there can be um, business and tax advantages to this as well. Um, generally, the, the business advantages are things um, that are secured through um, treaty agreements that facilitate things like importing, exporting, setting up businesses in, in a certain area. Um, 
uh, you, you know, so for example, um, doing business with Israel, if you're from um, Arab countries in the Middle East can be very challenging. And some, sometimes people find it much more easy to, um, and more facilitating to say, get citizenship in a place like Cyprus, which they're all already using for business connections to deal with some of the geopolitical relations with that. Turkey, right? I mean, you know, we've been kind of talking about Europe, but where citizenship by investment really, you know, it's not really operating in Europe in, in a very strong way right now. And, and the real programs are elsewhere in the world, whether it's the Caribbean, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's the Pacific. So if we're talking about citizenship by investment, I think we really have to expand our, our area of focus out, outside of Europe, particularly at the at this juncture. Um, and so, and, and, and that's where also these, these business benefit um, issues come in. You, you, um, could go into more detail on that. Also, tax advantages, they're always complicated. Um, it has so much to do with, you know, I'm American, so, you know, I have a particular, you know, relationship to tax that most people in the world don't have, but usually it's based on physical presence. Um, and if, if we think about the way that people, you know, the wealthy structure themselves um, to avoid or evade taxes, usually anything you want to do, you can do without these programs. So the programs, you know, it's really kind of a case by case thing, depending on a personal circumstance, there's some tax advantages, but it's, it's complicated. Um, in the end. And all of these drivers of demand, one might say, are very sensitive to geopolitics, um, whether it's tensions in the Middle East, tensions between Russia and the West, Brexit. So Brits are now looking for residency options and citizenship in Europe if they don't have the right ancestry. Americans right now because of COVID. Um, and it can also decline as well. So China getting better visa-free access to um, places can dampen demand. Might also remark that COVID-19 has, has also affected demand as well. So we see increasing demand from people from wealthy countries, especially places like the US, looking for options for travel options in a way that we didn't have. And also that has affected calculations around plan B. So people are looking more for a medium term place with livability, access to private health care. Um, and, and so that's shifting as well. If we think about potential problems then, um, you know, probably many people who've been following this have looked at Al Jazeera's very impressive work on Cyprus. Um, so there can be, you know, issues around corruption, but I think we also have to keep in mind that um, we also have to situate that as well. So, for example, the video reporting, which was really, it was really impressive. Um, they were looking at cases of people circumventing the program by basically giving kickbacks to government officials. Um, so so they, they weren't going through the official program where a bureaucrat in the Ministry of the Interior has to vet all of the applications they're going outside it. So that's sort of one form of issue that can come up. Um, another one that, that Al Jazeera flagged was something like um, were cases of people getting citizenship despite violating the rules. Um, and that was a pretty small minority. It was about 1% or so. So it's not that corruption exists, but I think we also need to contextualize it. We need a lot more information about what's going on with that. Um, and then finally, I want to mention more significant, I think, is this question of whether the investments are being used in a productive manner, in a way that builds economies and provides broader benefits to the populace. And here, I won't speak too much about the citizenship programs because my research is focused more on the residence programs, and I think they're very distinct, but you, we can talk, it, it, it might lend um, some, some useful insights. Um, I just simply have better info from studies um, to talk about this. So if we look at residence by investment programs, so-called golden visa programs in the European Union, and I've done some regression analyses to look at the economic outcomes, you can see that countries implement the programs significantly. They can you know, be shown to do this. Um, they implement programs in, to address economic need, which um, Yelena has also shown in her work, but you can also show that they they address specific failings in the economy as well. So they're really tool to address um, economic problems. However, the money brought in through the programs represents only a small portion of foreign direct investment coming in, usually less than 5%, with the exception of Portugal, where it's about 15% of foreign direct investment, and Latvia, where it's about 30% of FDI. However, in those countries, FDI is a smaller proportion of the overall economy, so you have to keep that in mind too. So they're addressing economic need, but usually in small ways. But you can say, why turn away a buck? Um, notably to this question of whether they destabilize real estate markets, which is, has been a major concern as well. It hasn't, we haven't seen that much um, as well. The investments are only about 3% of real estate transactions or less in all of the cases across the EU. Brits, for example, you may see many more foreigners buying, many more other Europeans buying real estate in these countries than, than we do through these programs, with the important exception of Greece. And this is, I think, where a big problem, big potential problem to be aware of, um, where the country right now, about a third of its real estate transactions are through its residents by investment programs. So it's something, I think that that's a key point of con concern to keep in mind. I'll wrap it up there.
Thank you very much, Christine, for this very insightful presentation. I will go to the questions for you because I know you need to run in a couple of minutes. Uh, we have a very interesting question from uh, Martin Vink, who asks you about being a researcher in this field. So could you provide some reflections on investigating the investor citizenship industry? You obviously need to get close to the intermediaries and government officials in order to access data about motivations for these programs. Uh, but how do you distinguish what are often publicly pitched as programs for economic growth, whereas in practice they may be driven by, for instance, financial uh, interests of individual officials or intermediaries? Um, you, you know, this is what ethnographers do. They go out and do fieldwork and talk with people and find out what's going on. And so I started going to these big conferences that they have all over the world where I got to meet, you know, the intermediaries, the government officials, kind of the, 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 you know, the heart of the market really operating as a market. And I kind of expanded out there to do other sorts, you know, research, you know, what goes on in individual countries and try to get at it at, at other, other sorts of angles as well. Um, you know, of course, for the intermediaries, yeah, they're making money off of it. That's why they do it. And that, that's kind of an obvious statement to make. Um, you know, but what you can also find out from intermediaries are, are what are the motivations and, and how those change for, for different people as well. I mean, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting questions you, you can ask um, of these people. And, you know, you're basically asking them about their jobs. Um, for the most part, you, you know, the, these are legal programs. You're, you're asking them, um, you know, how do these work? Talking to due diligence firms, how do they see these things? Um, you know, talking to, you know, you can, you know, approach it from these different perspectives, going to the countries themselves, asking people on the street, what did they see? I mean, I was struck, I was in St. Kitts, 19 out of 20 people I talked to supported the program and were very defensive of it. And, uh, you know, and, you know, thought the US was trying to shut down their thing. I mean, you know, which was surprising for me, I didn't expect that. Um, so I found it fascinating to get, you know, these different perspectives and, um, uh, in this sort of work. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And we have another question for you from Bronwyn Manby, who says that if you accept that investor citizenship creates no problem, what about the use of the so-called economic citizenship sold by Comoros to the United Arab Emirates and Kuwait to impose Comorian citizenship on stateless Bedouins who did not want it? So if uh, Martin, who's spoken before, says that we have to accept investor citizenship and not impose a genuine link requirement, how can we make a clear distinction in this case and say that it's actually legitimate? Well, I don't, I don't say that it creates no problems. I think that you know, the issues it creates are the subject of sociological analysis. That's what's interesting for me. Um, and, and the case of the Comoros, that's, you know, I think that was deemed illegal under international law. There are a, a lot of program problems with that program. Atusa Abrahamian has obviously done a lot of work on that. Um, Nora Lori has also done work, work on those as well. Um, you know, so I, I direct you in, in to looking at, at their work on this, um, you, you know, showing that the imposition of citizenship is, I think, even legally Ill illegal. Um, let alone the problems with how, how the money was flowing and the intermediaries and all of that. Thank you so much, Christy. So just to, in a way, finish, because I know that you have to leave, uh, how do you see the future of investor citizenship? You mentioned uh, in your speech a little bit the impact of COVID-19, but how do you see uh, more generally, more broadly in the post-pandemic world, uh, the evolution uh, of investor citizenship? Um, my guess is that it's it's going to spread more to more countries and outside of the European Union. So right now the EU doesn't really have any operating programs. The biggest program in the world is Turkey by far. Um, and, you know, places like Cambodia, Samoa, Vanuatu, um, these all have things that are, 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 are much more interesting for other people in the global south. Like if you're a Vietnamese, if you're wealthy Vietnamese, it can, all, you know, can actually be useful to have citizenship in Cambodia in order to build your businesses in Vietnam, <laughs> you know, to make yourself, you get more legal protection over your businesses by coming in as a foreign investor. So it can be a savvy legal thing to do, you know, in that sense. And in fact, this program, it's bigger than Malta's was before um, it was retired. Um, so I think we're going to see more outside of the global north and more in the global south. 
Thank you so much, Christine, and thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar uh, amidst your many um, commitments, and thank you for your interesting perspective. And now I would like to turn to uh, Laura Brio, who's a view from someone who has worked extensively uh, on the issues um, of investor citizenship for Transparency International, and who has uh, worked a lot on the problematic aspects of these programs. So, Laura, how would you, in a way, see the trade-off between these uh, benefits that investor citizenship can bring, uh, as opposed to the problematic aspects of these programs that you have seen through your work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Thanks, Yelena. Um, so uh, as Yelena mentioned, uh, coming from Indeed, coming from a, an anti-corruption activist perspective, um, we've been fo focusing mainly on the um, on the risks that the, this kind of scheme presents in terms of corruption and money laundering. And I think to illustrate the problems uh, related to investor citizenship, uh, the, the recent revelations by Al Jazeera on the Cyprus schemes known as Cyprus, the Cyprus Papers um, is a very good uh, textbook case of how bad it can be and what can go wrong with this kind of schemes and the way they are designed today. Well, a lot of them are designed today. Um, so the, what the Cyprus Papers show is that the problem is far greater than just a few bad apples or occasional uh, lapses of judgment. Uh, and it's well for, uh, summarized at one point in Al Jazeera's undercover investigation when one of the guys involved in this business says, no passport case is clean, uh, no passport case is clear. Uh, so that really shows that the problem is systemic. And uh, we have identified three features that make this kind of schemes particularly prone to abuse in particular. So the fast track processing of this application, which is uh, which can be done in a few uh, months time, so that we, that really allows a uh, little time for um, proper checks and controls on applicants. The second feature is the passive nature of investment that's required uh, and accepted, and most of the time in the real estate investment. So it just also can actually question uh, what kind of economic value that brings to the country, but also it makes it very easy uh, for investors uh, or applicants to actually uh, uh, apply. And the last one has been discussed at length in the first part of this webinar, but it's the little to no physical residency requirement. Um, and if you think about it, if you're really genuine about bringing value to uh, um, economic value to your country, you would want to attract investors who are willing to invest time, energy and money into the country. Uh, so they should not be this kind of conditions to be attracted. Um, we've identified other problematic aspects that are related to the way um, these uh, programs are run. Uh, so it's not only about this condition, but it's also about the level of controls and checks that are made on applicants, which is insufficient in relation to the profile of these applicants. Uh, we're talking about high net worth individuals, um, for sometimes politically exposed persons. So the, the control that should be made, uh, like in consequence, should, should be adequate. And very often they're just, either the requirements just to check the criminal record, um, or you check the origin of the funds, but not, not the origin of the wealth. And you can imagine that if you're in someone who wants to uh, get a visa, you're gonna try to just use clean money to actually get the passport in order then to uh, actually um, uh, channel illicit funds, but you're not going to use these illicit funds to actually uh, pay for your passport. Um, and so, and there's no wonder with that, with the processing time of a few, like a few months time, um, you can't actually do proper checks on uh, on applicants. Another problem is related to uh, the family members that can apply as part of a main, app, like a, an application. Um, it can be used as a Trojan horse, and we've seen some cases apparently in the in the Cyprus paper, it's been reported by the auditor's office of Cyprus, um, which actually you would have a main investor hiding in, in the in the pool of family members uh, who has something to hide, and you put your I don't know your uh, uh, daughter, granddaughter uh, there, uh, or your cousin uh, who has a clean record, and it's, it's as a main applicant, and it's all good. Uh, so it would be important that all applicants, main and family members, are subject to the same level of checks. 
the second problem is related to the regulation of the industry with thriving on the sale of passport. Currently, it's self-regulated, um, and yeah, the, like the same rules don't apply. Like different, you have different type of business intermediaries, and they are not subject to the same rules. Um, so they are not subject to AML checks, but there are also risk of, risks of conflict of interest. Um, so all should all this should be regulated and uh, at EU level. But I'll, I'll touch upon this a bit later. Uh, third problem, governance issues, uh, problem of independence and political discussion. Again, it's, it's been seen uh, in, in the Cyprus papers. Um, the audit in, auditor in Cyprus identify cases of interference uh, from the Minister of Interior to speed up the application review process um, and using the word clear discrimination. Um, then we have problems of transparency, no clarity on objectives and assessment of impact against the objectives. And I think that's an important point that's been raised about the benefits. Are there real benefits, economic benefits? Still, like it seems that it still needs to be demonstrated in many, uh, uh, for many schemes. Um, and um, more worrisome, the lack of exchange of information between European member states. Uh, in particular on rejected application. We've seen some cases like uh, the cousin of uh, Bashar al-Assad, Hami Marlof, who got rejected, like his application got rejected in Australia and he got it in Cyprus. Um, and this leads me to another problematic aspect, which is the last one I'll, I'll wrap up afterwards, um, is the lack of formalization at EU level, um, which makes the EU very uh, vulnerable to risks. Uh, we've seen, for example, the case of a Russian nas national who was, who was arrested by Finnish authorities on grounds of corruption and money laundering in the real estate, in a real estate sector in Finland. And he was found to be in possession of a Maltese passport obtained in 2015. Um, so it's exactly when the program was set up um, in Malta. And so we see that it's not just the problem of Malta, what it does with, the, with this passport scheme, it's also the problem of all EU members, uh, member states that actually undermine the, the, the principle of citizenship cooperation between member states. Um, clearly what these schemes are selling is not access to nice Mediterranean beaches, but access to the EU. So the, 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 the EU dimension of the problem is clear and the solution should be uh, addressed at EU level. Um, I think I'll stop here. I'll have much more to say, but perhaps to be addressed uh, later in the question. I don't want to take up too much time. Thanks, Yelena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for this wonderful presentation and for the insights that you could give us from your work for Transparency International. And I hope that we will have a vigorous debate in the Q&A session. Now, I'd like to turn to Manuela Boatka. Uh, and I was wondering uh, what your thoughts would be on the benefits and drawbacks of investor citizenship from the viewpoint of sociology and especially in terms of global inequalities. Manuela, over to you. Thank you so much, Elena, for putting this together. It's a wonderful panel. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to try to make it structured enough uh, so we can have a discussion afterwards. Um, but maybe the first thing to say, it would be that um, the benefits of investor citizenship for individuals would be that um, it is a means of translating material wealth into global social mobility. We've talked about the mobility aspect that um, obviously is um, a a boon for everyone using the institution of investor citizenship, but global social mobility is um, something that I think has to be emphasized in that uh, at the global level, getting a second citizenship or a better citizenship, and I'm going to um, get to that in a moment, is basically a strategy of both eluding the fact that citizenship is ascribed at birth. I mean, for that, um, Ayelet's work um, is absolutely um, crucial and uh, I've learned a lot from it, right? How citizenship basically in whatever arrangement is ascribed um, at birth. Um, if you buy your citizenship, you elude that ascription, but you can even um, elude um, the migration process altogether. As uh, Kristen mentioned, you don't even have to use the passport. It's um, if you use it as a guarantee, you have it and it offers you um, several advantages, um, even in, in terms of tax um, planning or um, as Henley and partners put it, um, citizenship and residence planning, which is something we don't normally associate with the institution of citizenship, um, the planning of it. And it doesn't have anything to do with the genuine link, right? 
So um, in terms of uh, having a global perspective, what I would like to emphasize is um, that we've been discussing a lot um, what investor citizenship means for states and for what kinds of states, but um, the global perspective teaches us first that the institution of citizenship not only ensured the at least relative inclusion of population of na nation states uh, in today's global north, but also enabled the selective exclusion of the colonized and or non-European populations from the same rights, uh, social and political rights throughout recent history. So the possession of citizenship of a former colonial power remains to this day a crucial factor. And we've seen that not only in um, the, the dreamers example, but uh, maybe taking the recent controversy over the Windrush generation's rights to UK citizenship following the detainment and denial of rights to, to a large number of members, especially of Caribbean origin, um, shows us that this uh, arrangement, a colonial arrangement from which the institution of citizenship emerged has enduring consequences until today in that it presents us citizenships as seemingly disconnected. So what investor citizenship does among other things is reconnect some individuals with some rights from which they had been disconnected, but not necessarily in the same order in which their relationship took place in the beginning. Because basically the rights that accrue from citizenships of, the, um, of wealthy countries after centuries of colonial rule became a scarce good on a global capitalist market with highly unequal negotiating positions. So the trend towards selling passports illustrates um, basically the coloniality of citizenship. And in that sense, I find the Caribbean a microcosm of these dynamics of kind of contradictory advantages and disadvantages. On the one hand, we have formerly colonized Caribbean states that currently sell passports to investors. On the other hand, sorts of colonial forms of citizenship persist in those Caribbean territories that are still under European or US occupation. So that Puerto Rico, Guadeloupe, or, or Martinique use their US or European Union citizenship for colony to metropole migration, as well as for global mobility more generally. Whereas independent Caribbean territories, such as St. Kitts and, and Dominica, Antigua and Barbuda, and um, ever more actually, use their Commonwealth citizenship as a development strategy. So it is the residual benefit of a colonial situation thus offering investors the opportunity to acquire citizenship and mobility in return for investment. Um, what that does, um, allowing investors to buy citizenship means allowing a wealthy, overwhelmingly male, non-Western minority to acquire a set of second citizenship. Um, so these programs in the Caribbean were either revamped or implemented in the wake of the 2008 recession. So basically they are an economic means that have nothing to do with um, the ideal um, worth of citizenship. So to say they are a business decision that provides investors with the right of visa-free travel to core countries, the citizenship of a Commonwealth member state, and in some cases exemption from personal income tax. Beneficiaries have so far been Chinese, Russian, but also Lebanese, Egyptian, and Syrian investors with numbers rising over the last decades for, for all of them. And that reflects the fact that the number of billionaires in middle-income countries has tripled in just six years, um, despite um, the recession from 2008. Um, so to get to just a few um, kind of problematic aspects, first of all, I've um, pointed to how this reinforces inequalities, basically, um, for the independent territories of um, the global south, former colonial citizenships um, have been turned into bargaining currency in what is already an unequal worldwide distribution of material goods and rights to goods, among which mobility rights uh, rank very high. At the same time, um, while investment citizenship and residence programs open what Roxana Borbulescu has called global mobility corridors for the ultra rich. It's a corridor. Strategies that provide low income migrants or labor migrants or refugees with far more limited paths to mobility are singled out as illegitimate and criminalized. And at the same time, what we see is that states also lose control 
not only gain control over their um, wealth in seeing investor citizenship as a type of development strategy, because um, state bureaucracies uh, as administrators of investor citizenship lose importance um, by giving over control to um, kind of um, agencies such as Henley and Partners or Art and Capital, mostly located in tax um, free or relaxed um, zones uh, where the wealth management is done by the agency itself and wealth is transferred to these private transnational actors who basically cash in on the conflict between the interests of states and those of very wealthy individuals. I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Manuela, for uh, your for your insights uh, in this incredibly interesting topic. So I would like to remind the audience to please post your questions on the Q&A board and please write uh, to who the question is directed. Um, I will start with a question from Lillian Prost, who uh, has worked on nationality in Jordan, uh, and I would like to address this question to Lore. Uh, Lillian says, in Jordan, investment citizenship programs have existed since about 1999, but they have never been added in terms of a new mode of acquisition to the nationality law. Instead, the programs operate based on cabinet decisions and instructions. Uh, what do other state, states take similar measures uh, and reduce the visibility of such programs? So in this sense, whether states use their discretion to naturalize and how would you judge the transparency of such programs as opposed to uh, the open programs such as those of Cyprus and Malta? Thanks, thanks, Elena, and thanks, Lilian, for the question. Um, so most of the time, these programs are separate from uh, nationality law. Um, in our, uh, we produced a report back in 2018 where we actually listed um, the schemes, residence, and uh, and uh, citizenship. Um, and we also added one, which is a bit of an exception. It was the Austrian program, which is part of the nationality law, but we highlighted it, we put it in the batch of uh, golden, what we call golden visa or golden passport schemes, because it presented the same level of risk. They were like the, the amount invested was uh, uh, about uh, 10 million euros, which uh, in, in, on average, even if there was not a price tag uh, uh, in the law itself. Uh, it just appeared to us that it was also a, a bit of a risky scheme, but usually it's separate programs with a price tag on it. So for Cyprus, for example, it would be 2 million euros uh, minimum and uh, like for, depending on the country. Um, and yes, indeed, uh, they, they are, I highlighted it in, in my presentation, there are really big uh, governance and transparency issues uh, associated with the schemes uh, in general. Uh, problem of uh, independence and political discretion. Uh, you, you don't, you have very often a higher level of uh, the political sphere that's involved. Um, you've you've risk, got risk of a conflict of interest and there's no transparency on who is applying, who is rejected, who is successful. Uh, the name of um, most of the time, some, some countries uh, provide this information, but most of the time we don't have any information on the name of uh, successful applicants, the nationality, or it's just aggregated. So having a bit more information on this would be very useful. Having information or so on where the money goes, where the money invested goes, because you have also requirement to invest in some national funds and how this money is dispersed and used would be, um, would be useful. Thank you very much, Laura. Uh, Alexander Stingle uh, says that Manuela introduced a good emphasis, citizenship for individuals. And that opens the question about citizenship like rights and duties given to corporate persons. So to turn the investor citizenship question on its feet, um, it could mean that the idea is to bestow citizenship rights to persons that invest regardless of individual or corporate. And the issues with investor citizenship are derivative of the prior uh, development. So I was wondering, Manuela, whether you could reflect on this comment and what your take would be on it. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Alexander and, and um, Yelena for bringing this question up. I think it's, um, an interesting link to colonial history in 
at least two ways. First, because in the wake of the French um, Revolution, the um, way in which citizenship was defined uh, within continental France, as opposed to France's colonies, differed, uh, namely by race. Uh, and it, after a long debate, it was decided that if you're not white, basically, you could not be a citizen, whether or not you were propertied. Although, actually, the idea of citizenship in the wake of the French Revolution was linked to property, but it would have meant that some freed um, slaves in, in Saint-Domingue, what is now Haiti, uh, would have become French citizens, whereas some propertyless white people in France would not have. So that, I think, is something that we see um, until today in the link between property and, and as wealth in investor citizenship and citizenship rights. And um, this, in the context of Brazil, has been described as whitening with money. Basically, if you're buying into rights that are associated with a community of um, white wealthy people um, and some privileged others, you are whitening your way into and basically paying your way into whiteness rather. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Manuela. And you touched upon uh, in your speech uh, the gender dimension of uh, investor citizenship, which I think is also very, very much relevant for understanding this um, highly contested notion. I would like to direct Yossi Harpaz's question to Lore. Uh, as you know, there are different uh, strategies for acquiring citizenship, uh, including the ancestry or ethnicity based acquisition. And strategic birth. Uh, and according to Yossi, they create much larger numbers of citizens with a more lax vetting. Uh, they may also provide citizenship to many criminal or corrupt persons. So is there, what is it, uh, or is there anything about uh, investor citizenship that makes it particularly problematic when compared to the, the, these different ways of acquiring citizenship that you have encountered in your uh, policy work? Um, yes, well, I think what I've tried to highlight in my presentation was the very low uh, requirements in terms of acquisition of this uh, of citizenship in the case of uh, um, as investors' citizenship programs. Uh, the fact that it's fast tracked, that uh, it's um, um, like the, the kind of investment that's required very easy to make you can just uh, invest in any uh, in a, any property in the country uh, so the, so the, the the only criteria is money and uh, so 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 that that what makes it a bit difficult uh, like make it easy uh, or prone to abuse uh, also because the profile of applicants um, is, uh, is, is so particular. They are high net worth individuals, very rich people, very wealthy people. So it's, it's just a, a, a way like the, the fact the combination of having low requirements um, and very high uh, investment, uh, like a very high amounts of investment required, low requirement in terms of physical presence, etc., and high uh, investment requirement that is, is just prone to, to attract the wrong people. If you just have dirty money that you want to just uh, clean up or get rid of very very quickly, then then that's that's the way you you're gonna use. I'm a bit less familiar with other types of um, of programs mentioned in the in the question, uh, but what I can say is that the conditions and criteria uh, for selection in this kind of program is are very low and lax. Thank you so much. And I think that uh, from the Q&A uh, session with the audience, I would like to address the last question to uh, Manuela, uh, which is whether through investor citizenship, we actually legally endorse the discrimination uh, between citizens and whether um, how do uh, we fight the populist views uh, in view of the ethical aspects uh, of the power uh, of, of money in the context of investor citizenship? 
Yeah, thank you. I think you address a very important aspect with a discriminatory dimension, but I think investor citizenship is only the tip of the iceberg in the many ways in which there are discriminatory dimensions of citizenship as an institution. And the fact that we have um, such things as um, Hong Kong citizens being uh, British, um, over British colonial citizens, British overseas citizens, and others, stuff that we've seen um, kind of explode in the wake of of the amendments to citizenship um, law recently in, in 2020 um, is very telling for the long durée of how discriminatory the institution of citizenship is as such. Um, so the investor citizenship um, is a very visible way and very um, kind of um, obvious phenomenon that uh, people can address as an exception. But actually, I think the fact that um, a lot of loopholes were always available for those willing to pay up um, or for those willing to or able to use um, advantages in order to not obey um, by the rules um, is something that is not particular to investor citizenship. But it, of course, any type of privileging is prone um, to kind of undermining uh, democratic arrangements. But citizenship is not a democratic arrangement. It is only so if you see it uh, within a nation state or within the borders of a state. At the global level, citizenship is a mechanism of exclusion and it was meant to be one. Otherwise, it wouldn't function uh, as wealth preservations within nation state borders. Thank you so much, Manuela. Um, just to wrap up, I would like to come back to the speakers in the order uh, in which we started this, this webinar and ask each one of you to reflect uh, within a minute, and I do apologize for uh, the very short time frames that we have in this webinar, uh, what is the future uh, or of investor citizenship, or how do you see um, the future of these programs in the post-pandemic world? And we'll start with Martijn. Um, thank you, and also thank you to all the other participants. I really enjoyed uh, um, uh, this seminar. Um, so as to your question, I mean, uh, I, I, I suspect that it, investor citizenship and investor residence is, is here to stay. I think, I mean, as I think Ayat has shown in the work, it has expanded exponentially over the last years and decades. I think Kristen was right to say that it is likely to, to expand. And, and, and as I have tried to argue in my presentation, I, I don't think, at least when we focus on the EU, there's a whole lot that the EU can do right now. However, and I didn't have time to focus on this, I think if there's one area where you can perhaps do something, it, it is with respect to the issues that, that Laura mentioned, some of the malpractices that come with it, corruption, um, money laundering, I think the EU has more power to act there and there will be more support for the EU to act in this area. So if there is, if I you know, expect some changes or the changes that I think are most likely, at least within the EU, are changes uh, within uh, this area. Thank you uh, again, everyone. Thank you very much, Martijn. Lior, your thoughts on the future of investor citizenship? So again, I want to thank everyone in, for a fascinating uh, discussion and, and, and the two sessions. I think I, I mostly just want to agree uh, with the direction um, pointed out by Manuela and Christine, that the focus, the excessive focus on the EU programs is, I think, distorting uh, uh, perspective on what is going on. Again, I'm speaking from a normative uh, perspective, ethical, ethical perspective, on what is going on with um, with investor citizenship, and I think Manuela brilliantly pointed out how the issue of global inequality and especially these programs and how they operate in the global south um, act as a corrective, in a sense, to what uh, citizenship means globally as an exclusionary mechanism. So I think this is. Uh, I don't know about the EU, and it's possible that in the EU we we'll, might see the pressure of the Commission uh, to shut down these programs. But globally, I don't see any reason, again, for the reasons that Christine um, uh, mentioned in her, in her work, that these would not just uh, explode and, and be more and more common uh, throughout the world, and especially in the global south, where states uh, can benefit the most from them. Thank you so much, Lear. Ayelet, 
Yeah, I think you're asking us to look into the crystal ball. It's very hard to know. And I would want to also think through the impacts of COVID and what would it mean if a country actually grants you citizenship? Is it also obliged to give you health care? I think that would be a very important question. And if it's just you're purchasing a private health insurance, who's going to be the provider? Because I can see that really exacerbating inequalities within states. And uh, you know, the very few resources that might be there would go for private health uh, rather than the public health. So I would be extremely worried about that in the global south countries. So I think that um, I would I would uh, just explore. It's an open question. We none of us know, but I think we would want to monitor that. I think I want to make um, two points. I think in the European context, which was the invitation, uh, and thank you, you know, again, I just want to share everyone's point. It was a fantastic panel. Um, I think we will have to see, my prediction or my intuition would be that we would see the tightening of the intermediaries. I think that would be a very positive move, more restriction, not restriction, more regulation. Um, connected actually with the point that Martine made about and Laura made about um, the money laundering, et cetera. Clearly there's much more room there for action, but I would really want to hold to account, you know, uh, you, with lawyers, sometimes they need to actually provide their own signature, right? They're, they're sort of, they're attesting that they know that this, the information that was given to them to their best knowledge is true. I would want the investor, the, the intermediaries to do that. I would actually want them to be um, on the hook, uh, if they are the intermediaries, they are the ones who benefit most actually from this whole transaction, in addition, of course, to the individuals, but I believe more than the states themselves. So I think more regulation there would be um, it would be a direction to go. I think also we might see that in the European context that the citizenship uh, by investment actually uh, transforms more into residence by investment. So we might see that the pressures there are such, and I think that would make perfect sense for the European context. I think globally, I, we might very well see more of these programs. I don't necessarily, you know, Manuela and Dior and, and others uh, in, in the virtual room, you know that I care greatly about the global inequality, but I do find it a little bit of an odd solution for us to say the super rich will be the ones who benefit. That's how we address the global inequalities. I, I would, so I think I'm here, Manuela, you mentioned the corridors. I would really, if, if that's our goal to address global inequality, I think we need to start with the most vulnerable. So I, you know, my intuition there is actually not to say that this is, um, you know, to celebrate this as an opening. Sure, I, I would be glad if citizenship is relaxed, especially if it was removed from the descriptive elements. I'm, I'm there on board 100%. But I think all of us actually shared this intuition, including you, Manuel. So, you know, I think it's very, very important to trace that and also to bring out some of the concerns that we have about the global dimensions. But to say that citizenship by investment is going to be our, our sort of hooray, we broke it, I would just not, not be in part of that camp. I would want to suggest that it's, it's exacerbating, it's the richer within those uh, less well off countries. Why, why benefit them rather than others? So, if we really want to revisit citizenship, I think we need something much more radical. And I would work about mobility rights attached to the individual, irrespective of his or her citizenship status. That would be my direction to go. I think it's much more promising and would also undo these tremendously powerful structures of exclusion that we still have. So my direction would be there. And I think I would be, oh, it's an open invitation for everyone in the current room and the virtual room to think through that. And I do think that this would be, for me, a more promising route if we really want to address the, the serious concerns about global inequality. Uh, but really, we will have to see. And mostly, I do think that actually Europe, in a sense, would standardize itself. It would look a little bit more like the US and Canada and Australia. That's my prediction. So I, I don't think citizenship for sale is going to remain for long in Europe. Um, we will see more. I think the residency, yes, but that would be my prediction on Europe, which is sort of the focus of our analysis and how precisely this is done. I think we, we, we elaborated earlier. I think it's still an open question, but that would be the directionality. But again, we might meet in two years and there would be another crisis and we would all uh, have proven wrong. So, you know, with, with a big grain of, of salt and, and, and just the caveat of we just don't know. So thank you for again for this wonderful seminar. Thank you so much, Ayelet. And Laura, what do you think will happen with investor citizenship programs, especially as regards their transparency and um, especially from, uh, from the angle of the potential for corruption? Um, yeah, I think the message I've been trying to convey in my presentation was that by design, the schemes are prone to abuse and were made to attract the wrong people. So the problem will not be easy to fix just by tightening up the rules here and there, launching, uh, like revoking or launching infringement procedures on an individual basis. Um, we need a full-fledged system to regulate the business and suspend risky scheme, schemes. 
And for the over schemes, uh, we need to set minimum standards at EU level. And one thing I, I just wanted to address earlier, but I haven't had a, the chance is that even if they are different from a legal perspective and from the perspective of the rights they, they offer or the grant, from an anti-money laundering perspective, um, residents and investment and citizen scheme should be treated together because very often residence schemes uh, offer an indirect route to citizenship and uh, can actually present the same level of risk we've seen, uh, for example, in the case of uh, Portugal. And um, another thing uh, I wanted to, to mention is there's an alert on uh, the fact that even if uh, uh, some schemes in their most problematic or in their riskiest form are suspending, like in Malta or, or Cyprus currently, the tendency is to see them reappear in another form and uh, which does uh, might not appear any less risky. So to be monitored, it might be actually more difficult with the COVID crisis. We also might see with the COVID crisis a uh, redistribution of the cards uh, uh, as regard to which country is more attractive uh, um, than another. And I don't know, perhaps you're looking at how Europe is now, you might, uh, you might actually um, go down the, the scoring um, and might not appear as the top destination in the future. But yeah, I think we absolutely need some regulation, these discussions to happen at EU level. And one way to start doing it would be to frame the issue as part of the anti-money laundering debate. That wouldn't solve the whole problem, but at least that would allow to get out of this uh, question of like sovereignty, uh, EU competence, uh, at least regulation, uh, uh, anti introducing anti-money laundering uh, regulation is something the EU could do. Um, again, it's really uh, far from being uh, completely satisfactory, but that would be a first step. Thank you so much, Laura. And finally, we turn to Manuela for the wrap-up statement. Yes, thank you so much, Emma. Um, I learned a lot from, from this panel. Um, I'm not going to give a prognosis because um, sociologists have a very bad reputation in um, having predicted anything. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up by uh, coming back to the title, which we haven't really um, gotten into or discussed, is Investor Citizenship a Challenge for Citizenship or a sign of its transformation. And I would say that it's neither um, because um, the fact that we are discussing here a phenomenon that remains a minority phenomenon speaks exactly to what um, Ayelet pointed to. It's not a, a solution for global inequality. It is a corridor for a very small elite, for a very small wealthy elite, even if it might be a non-Western one. And what it does produce is basically more of the same. It's the plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Uh, it's the, the first kind of um, reinforcement of capitalist dynamics that will lead to a, a reinforcement of global inequalities. And just two very short examples in order not to give a prognosis, but to describe what I've seen. Um, after um, the series of hurricanes hit the Caribbean in 2017, those independent states in the Caribbean that provide citizenship by investment have slashed their prices to $100,000 from, at, for some it was 250000 Why? They were trying to raise emergency funds for the damages incurred by the hurricanes. So what happens is we enter into, a, we enter a race to the bottom. Um, and states enter a race to the bottom in terms of how they use investor citizenship and individuals and states um, that provide investor citizenship enter this race to the bottom. And the Caribbean programs after the hurricanes boasted, um, and, I, and I quote, the magnetism of a Caribbean passport um, is um, slashing is um, 10 times cheaper um, than Malta and also cheaper than St. Kitts and Grenada CBA passports. The same kind of statement that um, Moldova made in 2018 uh, by trying to sell citizenship to investors, uh, although it's not an EU member. So how do you become competitive? You boast your cheapness, it, it enter the race to the bottom here. This is not a solution for either global inequality or development. It is um, basically being a feature of capitalism instead of a bug, as someone said. I'll stop here and thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers who have made some room in their busy schedules to attend this webinar today, and each and every one of you from the audience who 
attended this session and especially those who uh, asked our presenters the comments. I hope that this webinar has started a broader conversation on uh, the very much uh, controversial topic of investor citizenship. Uh, and I hope that uh, you will all join us on the 23rd of February when Joshua will convene our next webinar on citizenship and uh, equality. Uh, the recording of the present webinar will be made available at our website, globalcit.eu. Thank you very much.